Welcome to You Are From God, where we open the Bible and learn to see the image of God in ourselves and the people around us. I'm Scott Taylor. And I'm Tyler Hall. Thanks for joining us today. Welcome back. We are so glad that you have tuned in. Today we are going to be kicking off a new series of episodes here on You Are From God. And this introduction one is really important as we lay the groundwork for what comes next, Scott. We want to spend a few minutes talking with our listeners today about loneliness, about real connection, and about God's solution for this very real problem. You know, earlier this year in May of 2023, the Surgeon General came out with an advisory where he called loneliness an epidemic in our country. And among other statistics and things you can read in this report, 58% of U.S. adults report feelings of loneliness. Now, certainly some of those can be of more extreme cases. Uh, Some of them are just, you know, again, feelings that come and go. But certainly it's important to realize that people struggle with loneliness to varying degrees and at varying times. And it's a real thing. I'm mindful of the very beginning when God makes Adam and he acknowledges it's not good for man to be alone. And he makes Eve as that uh, partner for him. And so... God knows that even just from a human standpoint, we are made to be connected with other people. And there is a real need for relationship, certainly between people in general, but also when we think about this from God's design, God's people especially understand the value and the need for real connection. And one of the things that we were talking about earlier, Scott, from this Surgeon General Advisory is that we are more connected than ever in the sense that we have the opportunity to be connected. The technology and the way that the world works now, there is just so many ways to find new people, connect with new people, stay connected over long distances and times. And yet we're facing this where more than half people say, I feel lonely. And it's this picture of somebody in a crowded room and they feel like they have no connection. And so that's what we really want to think about and talk about today as we address this issue. I think it is so important to understand that part. We have come through a pandemic, and it's been difficult on everyone, certainly um, maybe more on on some. But the reality is we also had this technology that you could see the other person or see the congregation or whatever you, you were looking at. And Tyler, as we were talking about before, it just struck me that would a grandfather or grandmother rather look at the child, their grandchild, on a screen that they're actually seeing them, can talk to them, or see them in person. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it comes down to. God has made us to have relationships, not only with him, first and foremost, but in so doing, having relationships with other people and and understanding what this looks like in our relationship with God includes other people. And that's the dangerous part when we begin to exclude ourselves from various things. And there's no wonder why people are so lonely when it comes to any of this, first of all, people, not everyone has a relationship with God. So you have that. And then you have the fact that Christians sometimes have kind of cut themselves off from other Christians or we're not looking for opportunities to be with one another. Both are highly important to, to do. And you think about First John, the, the fifth chapter and, and verse two, and you really begin to understand as the whole Bible points this out, um, just the relationship piece that is so important and how connected our treatment of other people is with our relationship with God. And this is just one of the verses that you can look at. He says, by this, we know that we love the Lord, or the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. And so what does this tell us? We know that we love uh, the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. It is all intertwined. It is all together. God, the creator of all things is telling us in order for you to show me love, you're going to show it to other people. It's going to be seen in your treatment and in the big sense in the book of First John of neighbors. It's going to be seen in the treatment of your brothers and sisters. It's going to be seen in how you treat other children of God and understanding what it looks like to observe those commandments. It's not a mistake, Tyler, that the greatest command is to love God. And then the second one that, that Jesus will mention is you love your neighbor. I mean, that's this is what it all comes down to. It's intertwined in both things, and we need to make sure that we're doing it. Verse 3 goes on and says, For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. As we talked about many times on this podcast, this is always comes down to our relationship with God. They are burdensome if you don't have a relationship with him. And that's the 
truth about about the uh, scriptures and what it has to say. If you have a relationship with him, if you know him as he intends for us to do, they're not burdensome. And therefore, I'm going to treat other people the way that I know I'm supposed to treat them and love other people as I'm supposed to, because God has told me to. And that's the attitude that his children are supposed to have. Verse two is also fascinating because John in this letter makes it clear a couple of different times that if we say we love God, we need to love our brother. And so the inverse of this verse has been laid out pretty clearly. By the time he gets to chapter 5 and he's winding down on this writing, he actually kind of flips it. He says, do you want to know if you really love someone? Here he's talking about the children of God. But what does real love for another fellow human look like? It's when you love God and obey his commandments. So to your point there, they're intertwined. And you can say, I love God, but if you don't love your brother then you really don't love God. Well, right. here we see that the inverse is true as well. I can say, I love my fellow man. I love the people around me. But if I don't know God, love God, and obey, keep, observe his commandments, then whatever you're calling love is actually just a counterfeit, which is which is scary to think of from the worldly standpoint. But even as Christians, if I'm not thinking about how to obey God, follow his commandments, walk in the spirit as he's called me to, then I'm not really practicing genuine, true, authentic love that that people crave, that really builds that connection. One of the things as we talk about loneliness, too, and, and the struggle with being connected, really connected with people, is certainly there's circumstance. You've mentioned the pandemic. You've mentioned uh, there's there's things that we can struggle with that aren't necessarily of our own design, whether we face anxiety or social awkwardness or whatever might be part of the equation. Sometimes it's our own stubbornness, though. You know, some of us might have this obstacle to overcome in our own way of thinking that say, well, people ought to come to me on my terms, and this is how I want to connect with people. But you don't get to control other people. Again, one of the powerful things we've talked about in this program time and time again is that God has given us free will. That includes you and that includes me. And so in any relationship, the only person you can control is yourself. You don't get to make the other person say, well, okay, I need to do this for this. Part of God's design for that genuine love is putting each other first and favoring the other over yourself and putting the interests of others ahead of your own. And so when we get to that verse in 1 John 5, 2, it's this genuine love for God, genuine love for fellow man. And it's God making it very clear. There is a need to have these relationships and build trust with other people and a connection that makes that work. So even if there's not a great quantity of relationships, the quality that God has designed us to have and that we are craving actually comes from God's own solution, which is powerful as we move forward and think about that. It's the hardest thing sometimes in our language, the way that we word things. So a lot of times we'll say we're going to church, and what we're talking about really is the building. We're going to a building, and we're going to to worship God ultimately. So it's all, we almost just throw all of that together (laughs) into one uh, word. And and the reality of, of what happens with that is that we miss really what the point of the church is and we and we miss really what that word is meaning it's the people it's the called out that we're talking about and so when we talk about going to church what we're missing is that we are the church we are the called out we are the uh, chosen with the ones that we have uh, have this relationship with God and so what happens in Acts the second chapter right when we see the beginning of this that is going on one of my favorite things about this is that you have people that had some things in common I mean they had the the Jewish laws they had all these different uh, pieces from a nation in common they didn't live in the same area they didn't necessarily speak the same language but they certainly had a couple of things in common but then verse 44 it says and all those this is Acts 2 and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common Well, the reality is when they have a relationship with God, when we start this relationship with God, we have all things in common because of God, because of that relationship now that we have with one another. So in Acts, the second chapter, 42 through 47, Tyler, you just really get this amazing breakdown of what it really is like to love God and to love one another. We have this sense of awe 
um, because of, of God and, and the fact that we can be together. So he says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. They began selling their property and possessions were sharing them with all as anyone might have need day by day, continually with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. You know, the interesting thing, Tyler, it's not it's not like the regular life stopped. They still had things that they had to take care of, responsibilities, issues that came up, health problems, all these different things. But the reality is their relationship with God was bigger than all of those things that they were dealing with. So much so that they were in with one mind continuing together. They were absolutely united as God's church together with one another as they worshiped God and as they took care of one another because of their relationship with God. And that's really what we're supposed to be doing uh, as his church. That's the attitude that we need to have. The struggle, Tyler, sometimes is that, as you said earlier, people are stubborn. People are too busy. People um, want to do things on their own terms rather than looking out for opportunities to help other people. That's, that's the danger. And that's something that we all need to look in the mirror and make sure that that's not what we are doing and, and understanding the importance of other people in our, and as we call it here at West Mason, our family. This is our family. And it's it's understanding that attitude that we need to have for one another because of our relationship with God. And that was the point right off the bat. A side note from this, Tyler, in the Gospels, you see a few times John, the ninth chapter comes to mind where the families, if they started following Jesus, were going to be kicked out of the synagogue. And there was a huge concern about that by a lot of them because that was their community. That's the way that they viewed their community. And how scary it would be to be kicked out. Now, some of them did because they understood the bigger need for a relationship with God, and we can understand that. But sometimes for us, we just don't view it to be our community. It's not our family. And I think going back to that kind of an idea is what you see in the scriptures is that we need to view one another as our family. We need to view one another as uh, the called out, the church that we are, and to be there for one another as, as our Father tells us to do as well. And that's where we're going in the next few episodes as we really try to sink our teeth into what does it mean that God has established his church for his people. And so over the next few episodes, we're going to look at how the Bible describes in particular an individual's place in the greater uh, community of the church. And so we look at a couple of different illustrations that are given, and one of them is family. And so it's not to say that we're like a family. It is, it is truly a family as God the Father has bringing his children together. And so we'll get into a lot of that. Acts chapter 4 continues this thought where it kind of returns back to this idea. Um, I think it's powerful, by the way, in Acts chapter 2 that they're meeting day by day, yeah. and sometimes we struggle what uh, I have to come out twice on Sunday or uh, I'm in the middle of a busy week and... Uh, I guess people are getting together on Wednesday night. Maybe I could go, maybe not. But they, in the early church, how important was it? They got together every single day. This is not a did I have to sort of question. This is I want to be together with those people. And the danger from that standpoint is today you have it as a checklist. Did I turn on the television mm. to watch? Right. Did I turn on the live stream and watch? Not worship, watch. Right. And that's the, again, the danger. Technology is wonderful. It's it's kept things together, but it's not a replacement for coming together and worshiping for those that are able to do so. That's that's the hardest part, Tyler, to get to 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 get people to understand it. The need to be with your brothers and sisters in Christ that you cannot get on a screen. You've got to be with one another. And that's um, unfortunately is an issue for a lot of people today. Yeah, we'll come back to Acts chapter four. But I, I want to carry that thought forward that you just introduced Actually, over in First Thessalonians chapter 2, at the end of this chapter, Paul's not even dealing with <laughs> streaming or internet connection. He's just talking about wanting to be with the church in Thessalonica, and he's writing this letter, and he says, that's not good enough for me. In verse 17 of First Thessalonians 2, he writes, But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face, 
because we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. And so he talks about, as he goes into chapter 3, that he sent Timothy to know how they were doing. But I just think it's powerful that Paul's saying, I can write you a letter, but I want to see you face to face. John, in the letters of 2nd and 3rd John, ends both of those letters by saying, I would rather not write with pen and ink. I want to come and see you face to face. The technology we have today is a blessing, but it is not a replacement for assembling ourselves together in person. That's how God designed it. He knows we need that physical interconnectivity in being in the same space and time with other people. And that's, again, what you see in Acts chapter 2 when the church is established as they can continue to grow in Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 32. Sounds very similar of what we just read. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. They go on and talk about how they're following the uh, apostles, that they're sharing what they have, and all these things come down to there's real genuine relationships being built. So somebody might come to this point in the episode and say, that's all great, I understand the value and need for community, but maybe it's you, or maybe it's a friend that you've talked to, or an acquaintance you have, that says, okay, but that's just your club, that's your church, that's your group that you found, and I can find that in my social group, or my work compatriots, or the people that I find and connect with in my own means without God involved. Hopefully, we've already made the point from 1 John chapter 5 and verse 2 that if real love is going to bind those relationships together, it must be founded on a love for God. But I think it's important, especially as we consider church as a word, the called out assembly, a group of people. Um, that's what that word literally means. So it all depends on how you use the word. In fact, later in the book of Acts, in Acts 19, that same Greek word in the original language gets used, but in a very different context. In Acts 19, there is a riot in Ephesus because of Paul's preaching. Those who are part of the business of idolatry, making the idols and so forth, start a riot and get everybody stirred up to get so mad at Paul and just the idea of the preaching. But in verse 32, they all kind of swarm together in this gathering place. But verse 32 is fascinating. Now, some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. The word assembly there, as it's rendered in the English Standard Translation of the Bible, is the word ecclesia, church. And so here you have a church but they do not know why they have come together. And there is confusion, and there's no unity because some people are crying out one thing and some people another. And so you can say that you have community and connection, but when God is not a part of that, we totally miss the purpose and design and the function and the real fulfillment of connection. And so as you think about these things today, we really want to encourage you to just understand that God knows that loneliness is a struggle for all of us. The Surgeon General came out with an advisory. God's always known that we struggle with loneliness. He knows we need to feel connected and feel that sense of belonging with other people. And he's given us this awesome blessing in the people in our lives, but especially in his church and the called out, the saved that he has redeemed for himself. That is where we are meant to find this deep and lasting connection and fulfillment in community. And so if you're struggling with connectivity issues, as it were, this week, we pray that you would look into God's word and see his wisdom in establishing the church and connecting with brothers and sisters in Christ to realize that all of us are from God. Thanks for listening. Show your support by leaving a review on your podcast app. And share this episode with someone you want to encourage. If you have questions or would like to get in touch with us, go to youarefromgod.com. That's youarefromgod.com.